Great, thank you.
panelists today, Judge Rendell Griffith, who will be one of our panelists today, Annette Shipman and Michael Shipman of uh, Germany, Mark Taylor, and also Julia Wright, who is the daughter of Richard Wright. Fortunately, she can't be with us in, in present today, but she's with us uh, online. Would like to also note that this event is in collaboration with the Love Not Fear mobilization for Mumia and campaign to bring Mumia home. <laughs> now, before I put my foot in my mouth, I can recognize everybody who's here who's done so much for not only this movement but for so many other social justice movements over many decades. But I would be remiss if I didn't recognize that uh, Mumia's grandson is here, Jamal Jr. In reality, is that none of us will be here but for Pam Africa. Mama. In Philadelphia, 
Over 33 people have been exonerated from wrongful convictions since 2018. And this is according to the National Registry of Exonerations. And of those 33 people who have been exonerated, 30 of them had withheld evidence in their case. That's 90.9%. Now, the District Attorney's Office in Philadelphia has proclaimed that withholding evidence is one of the most common forms of misconduct by prosecutors and police. They talk about the Brady matter, and Judge Griffin will explain in detail that we can all understand without going to law school what Brady's about. But Brady is a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that essentially says the DA has information that is for innocence or guilt, exculpatory or inculpatory, um, that they have to give it to the defense. That didn't happen in the Romania case. It didn't happen in 1981. It didn't happen in 1982 during the trial. It didn't happen in 1995 during the big uh, appeal hearing. But this matter of the district attorneys and prosecutors having to turn over information is not just Supreme Court of the United States or Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. It is also listed in the rules of professional conduct. Yeah, lawyers have rules of professional conduct. Surprising. Okay. But if you look under the rules of professional conduct, section 3.8, which is special duties of prosecutors, it says that they have to turn over information, making timely disclosures. I would argue that 36 years is not a timely disclosure. And I think I would say that without contradiction. But this notion of needing to turn over information to make the system fair, allegedly. This is also codified in the court rules. In Pennsylvania Code, Title 235, Rule 7, I'm sorry, Rule 573, also calls for timely disclosures. And I don't mean to bore you with all of these letters of the law, but by signing these letters of the law, we clearly see how Umea has been jerked for over 40 years. Now I could dress it up and put another kind of word on it, and from running the church, we could put some other kind of words on it. But this is just fundamentally wrong. And then here we have in Philadelphia, a district attorney who has made his whole persona releasing people from wrongful convictions and pointing out what prosecutors have done, what they've done wrong. And he's going on to say that even regardless of how much time has elapsed, these things need to be corrected. But we have a judge who's now sitting on me as a field saying that some of this evidence is time barred. You didn't bring it out in time. Wrong is wrong. And if it takes a hundred years to make that wrong right, then it must be done. And that's why we're here. One of the things that was so shocking in 1981, Pam, and you know because you were there, when Mumia was arrested, the first thing people said was, what? Mumia? No, this couldn't happen. This was a man who was known in the community as someone who worked for the people. He was called the voice of the voiceless. In journalists, the, American, the Society of American Journalists, the Society of Journalists has an ethics code. And in this ethics code, it says that journalists should give voice to the voiceless. But they didn't put that provision into their ethics code until the mid-1990s. So here we had a man who was performing as a journalist in the 70s, being known as the voice of the voices because he was taking care of the people. So this is the type of man who we are talking about here. And um, I'm going to stop talking and let you hear 
some of the things that this man has done. We have um, a solidarity message from uh, people in France who have been working diligently on this case. There's a group of people in France who have been picketing outside of the U.S. Embassy since around 1995. They were there weekly and then it became monthly. And uh, I know I've, I've seen them in there standing out in the cold with them, taking pictures with my fingers falling off. People all around the world see this injustice and, and, and they're moved by it. Um, Julia Wright got a message from the International Federation of Journalists. This is an organization that uh, has 600,000 members. And Dr. Fernandez has told me that it's now 600,001 because they uh, have now had we as a member of this organization. <laughs> the President's message from the International Federation of Journalists says, we would like to express our solidarity and support for you, Maria. Throughout the world, women and men and women are fighting against the inequities and arbitrariness uh, that have been subjected uh, to you for so many years. Your courage and tenacity are a source of admiration and set a great example with the ever-present hope of obtaining your release as soon as possible in solidarity and brotherhood. So we're going to move to uh, some video messages, uh, one from um, the French Collective, and then we'll also hear from uh, another icon, uh, the late uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, the anti-apartheid activist from South Africa. Take it 
into account the, the presence of offenses. C'est ce qui exclut le racisme dans ces décisions. But the justice is uh, excluding all racism. La justice, c'est encore, encore celle qui doit refuser de prendre en considération les témoignages estorqués. And the justice will take into account the uh, real testimony. La justice, c'est celle qui doit prendre en compte un comportement des magistrats. The justice will take into account the, uh, the, the judges. Les magistrats. Uh, être libre dans leurs décisions et ne pas fonctionner comme c'est le cas de l'UNIA. Nous devons de prendre la décision et de prendre la vraie évidence sur la pression de la police et non sur la pression de la police. Notre délégation qui a rendu ce jour visite à l'UNIA notre délégation qui a visité à l'UNIA n'est pas ici présent pour donner des leçons de justice à Casimir. Going to give lesson to Pennsylvania justice, mais pour sortir cet homme, pour soutenir pas pour cet homme, to support him, to support him, dans ses droits, to have justice, to have his right to have to have the right to have the access to real justice, qui lui permet de défendre son innocence, justice who can uh, help him to defend. Is right. La justice de Pennsylvanie s'honorerait d'en finir avec ses démons. La I mean, justice de Pennsylvanie devrait finir avec les démons. Qu'elle reconnaisse ses erreurs et ses fautes. Et qu'elle reconnaisse ses erreurs et ses fautes. La justice doit faire place à l'injustice. The agency should take back to justice. And la liberté à l'homme. And finally give freedom to move. That's it. Thank you. Uh, we visited from here today as a delegation from the International Federation of Journalists. My name is Larry Goldbetter. I'm the president of the National Writers Union in the U.S. and I'm the executive committee of the IOJ. And we offer Korea the support of the 600,000 journalists around the world.
thousands of folks gathered to make sure that we could halt his execution, we would hear from the words of Mumia Abu Jamal in 2000 when the RNC was having their conventions. We heard Mumia's name in 2011, right where City Hall sits when Occupy Philly took over. And in the camps, you saw signs that said Free Mumia Abu Jamal. In fact, in 2014, Darren Wilson. All of a sudden is pronounced not guilty in the killing of Mike Brown. And I remember being at, at you know the foot of City Hall and a young person says, What are we gonna do? Hit the streets. And in 2014, as we heard about talk about Ferguson, through those same Ferguson conversations, through it all, we heard the friend of Mumia Abu Jamal as part of the demands. In 2015, when we held the Philly is Baltimore rallies, we were talking about Freddie Gray and the connections of Philadelphia and Baltimore. People in Philadelphia were saying, free Mumia. In 2020, when hundreds of thousands of folks found their way down the parkway, all in the name of trying to free and understand the injustices of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and don't forget Tony McDay, Maude Arbery, so many others. You will look out into the crowd and you see Latinos for, for George Floyd. You see LGBTQIA for George Floyd. You might see the Moon Gang. You might see South Philly. But more importantly, if you look closely, what I saw was free movie of Mr. Masses. I saw a free Kamal Sabiki amidst the masses. I saw a free Lenin Peltier amidst the masses. I saw a free man Jamel al Amin amidst the masses. And what we're saying is that what Mumi has always said, not only is Philadelphia his home and Philadelphia is, he is our native son, but he doesn't want, it, want you on Philadelphia to remember just him. He wants you to remember all the folks, all the prisoners, who are elders, locked up in the of charges, who should be home in the back end of their family and loved And we will continue to have these conversations and we will be in neighborhoods as I close. And I'd be in this old neighborhood meeting with folks and they say, yeah, I remember when he first met the late, great Reggie Shell here in Philadelphia, Black Panther, home. Oh. One of my earliest mentors here in Philadelphia. I remember talking to folks who said, yeah, I remember when he would come around, he was our lieutenant of information. That's Mumi Abu Jamal. Lieutenant of information about the party as a teenager. And so when you hear the stories, the elders will tell you, yeah, Brother Gabe, you know, he wanted to change Ben Franklin High School, what is Spring Garden Street, to Malcolm X High. Some of y'all remember that story, huh? And so there's a richness in the fabric of what Mumia has met to this city. Whether you're from North Philly, Uptown, Southwest, wherever you're from, the reality is that that memory has always been a part of it. And it's that historical memory of movement that's going to take us forward towards his freedom. You know, there were some meetings of late with black clergy and other clergy members talking about support and I had a late, late, late call with an elder friend of mine who said, Gabe, I want you to share this because it's on my heart for you. And I'm sure my clergy friends who are, who are uh, in space today know this very, very well because it, it applies to us. Isaiah 61, I'm going to go there. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. 
Now I'm nobody's reverend, I'm nobody's pastor. But when I hear the terminology of freedom for the captives, I'm thinking about the black and brown and poor who have been locked down in Philadelphia for too long. When I think about freedom from darkness, I'm thinking about those who have been marginalized for decades, if not centuries. When I think about those who need to be free as prisoners, and those who have been incarcerated for too long, I think about those here in Philadelphia, with mom and dads and caretakers and parents who need to come home and be in their home and live up their lives in grace from Germantown Avenue to Woodland Avenue and everywhere in between. The reality is, what are we going to do today to assure ourselves because, like my elder once told me, and I want to bring him in as I close, Brother Abdu Sabor, may he rest in paradise. He's been in 36 as well, so Mumia moves more. He's always saying about the game, Mumia is not a person, he's a people. Mm. He used to say, Mumia is not a person, he's a people. He's a people that represents those who fight for justice, those who understand the value of resistance, those who are able to galvanize even against the greatest odds. Whether you're in the confines of a cell, or perhaps on a judge's bench. There's always a time to do what's right. And so not only are we calling on what we're asking, we're demanding on Judge Lucretia Clemens here in the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, sisterly affection, and family care, if you want to include that for my non binary folk. If we're going to do this work, there's always a time to do what's right. right. Now is the time to do what's right. Free them all from me. Thank you, Dave. And thanks for putting things in context. Jesse Jackson had a big phrase that they didn't really, really didn't want to give to him, but is it text without context is pretext. Right. Right. And so much of what we hear about the media leads the context out. So it's good to hear some of that Philadelphia context on the media. But what we're going to hear next is the context that has been missing from the courts for 40 years. Courts are supposed to be about justice. That's what we're all told. But when we look at Mumia's case, and all of the judges who have handled his case, and we're talking about dozens, it wasn't until 2018 that the word justice appeared in any judicial opinion related to Maria. It was when a Philadelphia judge, the young Tucker, looked at how a former district attorney of Philadelphia, a guy named Ron Steele, who went up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court with the help of the FOP, the main organization trying to, one, kill Mumia and then keep him incarcerated if they can't kill him. And Judge Tucker said that having Castile on that case was a fundamental injustice. And the courts of Pennsylvania said, well, Tucker, we don't know what you're looking at, but we don't see any problem here. And that's what the injustice is. So, Judge Griffin will break it down for us. To see, it tried to shroud law and mystery and said, you need to go to law school. And law school's not enough. You need to get an LLM. You need to get a master's to be involved before you fully understand. What you're going to hear today, what you're going to hear from Judge Griffin, you don't need a law degree to understand this. And that would have to lawyers and judges and people in that business. But this is common sense. What is so common in terms of the injustice makes no sense. And this is what you hear. Judge Wendell Griffin, is pastor of the New Millennium Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, and is a recently retired Arkansas 
state trial court judge. He retired from the Arkansas Judiciary in December 31st, 2022, and continues to work as a public theologian and as CEO and owner of Griffin Strategic Consulting, a private firm devoted to advising individuals, institutions, and other actors concerning cultural competency, equity, and inclusion. So the historic note, since we're still just what, two weeks after Black History Month, a little more Arkansas, we know so much because of the desegregation of school fights, but uh, Little Rock, Arkansas was the place where the first African American was elected a judge in 17, or 1873. Yes, Griffin Wistar Gibbs, who just happens to be a Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> That's a straight 
every word. Now, if I was someplace else, I would use a different word. All right. But where I come from, we call that jacked up. Okay? We call it jacked up. When that happens, the trial process is not just. It is jacked up. It is a sham. It is a farce. It is a fraud. And convictions that happen on that kind of basis cannot stand because quite frankly nobody should be able to do anything based upon the fraud. Can we agree with that? Yes. Now, that's not just something that one group came up with out of the top of the I say don't feel lost in the that. But it is in the law. It is in the law. There's a law, there's a case, we lawyers know about it, it's called Brady, B-R-A-D-Y, versus Maryland. And the short answer is, this dude named Brady was charged with a murder that was allegedly committed by him and his partner. Okay? And he pled innocent. His partner caught the plea and pled guilty of committing the homicidal act, killing the person in the next month's death, a robbery. Okay? Cops didn't tell Brady. The prosecutor didn't tell Brady that his partner had copped a plea. Brady went to trial and was found guilty of the murder because he said, I didn't kill him, but I did drive the car. And under law, under felony murder, you can be convicted of the murder. Brady got sentenced to death. Murder one. Appeal. Lost appeal. Lost appeal to the state Supreme Court of Maryland. Went to the U.S. Supreme Court. 1963, 1963, Supreme Court said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. The prosecution knew that his partner had caught to killing the guy. And they didn't tell him. You cannot let that conviction stand. 963 now. Understand? I'm just something all the other. Basically unfair. A sham. Jacked up. Right? So you gotta go back and try him over on the sentence on the sentence. Because he agreed that he was in the on the year. But his sense doesn't change. That's great. That's 963. That is. How many years before 1982? 39 years before Mamiya was trapped. That was the law of the land. And so the DAs in Philadelphia knew that any evidence that pointed toward Mamiya's innocence had to be delivered to his defense team. In 1981, they knew it. In 1982, they knew it. In 1983, they knew it. In 1984, they knew it. Go count the numbers. All the way to 2018, they knew it, and they did not disclose it. When Larry Krasner became the new DA, going to the DA's office, he found six boxes. Six boxes of information that pointed toward Mamiya's innocence. Anybody who says I'm lying, I ten time double dog dead. <laughs> to prove it. Six boxes. This is what this is about. This is what this is about. This is what Judge Lucretia Clemens has to deal with right now. This is this black woman judge who has in this case has to decide whether or not to follow the law that's been on the books since 1963 based on a law that's older than that because Brady vs. Maryland is based on the 14th Amendment due process clause which dates back to 1868. Okay? Don't ask me how I'm writing the law school. 
So this is not, this is not new for me. This has been the law for a minute. And so let's be real clear, folks. The law was clear for the DA in 1981. The law was clear for the DA in 2018. The law is clear for Judge Clemens now. Mamiya's conviction and sentence must not stand. It cannot stand. Because a sham is no reason to convict anybody. And a sham that the prosecutors have covered up you heard Brother Lynn talk about the prosecutors have an ethical code. They have to disclose this. So I'm trying to figure out how is it that a prosecutor had a code, got an ethical code, disclosed this, is now fighting. One of the prosecutors that is fighting on his motion to have his case turned over is now fighting in front of Judge Clemens. Right? Hello? So let, well, this is not just Philadelphia. Okay, let's, let, let, let me be real clear. Racism is racism. I've been back long. <laughs> I may have been born tonight, but wasn't born last night. Okay, and it, no, it's a long time. This is wrong. I'm a slam, but I want you to keep in mind. This brother should come home. And this judge, <laughs> this judge needs to hear our community say, Judge, you got the law. You got the power. Do what's right. We got your back. You do what's right. Is that all right? Is that all right? Is that all right? Is that all right? Yeah. If I was at home, I would say, let the church say, It's important to just really let this sink in a little bit. What we're talking about here is fundamental fairness. Yes. Due process, something that's guaranteed in the Constitution, not just the U.S. Constitution, but the Pennsylvania Constitution. It's codified in court rulings, and it's in, it's in called black letter laws in Pennsylvania Code, as well as the ethics codes. This is a report that Larry Krasner um, put out, a little background on it. The issue, the, the material that people are appealing in court, Larry Krasner found it. Yeah. It wasn't somebody that just went into a trunk of a car that had been abandoned for 36 years and found it. The DA himself found it. And this is a report that came out in June of, 19, uh, of 2021, and it was touting why they need to correct these injustices. And it mentioned that um, withheld exculpatory evidence was a matter in all of the cases that came over time. But listen to this, this is not Mary, this is Larry. Our oath as prosecutors is to seek justice unconditionally with no limit as to time. Right. Right. So if that's the case, Mr. Krasner, why are you in court fighting against this? And if the law means the law, Judge Clemens, why are you fighting this? Yeah. But see, the problem in the Mobile case is that the law has not been the law for him. Yeah. And that's why there's this thing called the Mobile exception. The law means the law, except for Mumia. There have been people that have been released directly from death row yes. in Pennsylvania when there, it's been found that there's been withheld evidence. And before we move into showing you the evidence that they claim is solid, and you'll see that it looks like two bits holding up a platform on a piece of sand. It's going to fall apart. 
There was a case in 1992, a guy named Jay Smith. Some of you may remember, Jay Smith was accused of killing a woman named Susan Reinhardt and disappearing her kids. Prosecutors in that case, the state police in that case, and the state attorney general's office in that case withheld evidence for two years. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was so outraged, they released him directly from death row. Who helped him with his appeal? A jailhouse lawyer named? Maria Abu Jamal. So here we have Jay Smith. Here we have Nikki Scarfo, head of the alleged head of the Philadelphia Crime Syndicate, and other mobsters. They released directly from jail because of without evidence and or prosecutorial misconduct. But the evidence has piled this high in the Mumia case, they say it doesn't matter. In 1959, Mumia was four years old, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued a ruling in a case where a guy in Philadelphia pled guilty to a murder. And the prosecutor and the judge said, well, just because he pled guilty, we can do what we want. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said, no, you can't. They said, just because if evidence of guilt piles as high as Mount Everest, Every defendant is entitled to all the fundamental rights of a fair trial. And that is not happening in the Romania case. Right now we're going to take a look at the video which you'll hear and see, not just hear, but see how flimsy the evidence is against Romania. Confessions. Police, right? There's a couple of people that are in the business of confessions, right? Police. In police, right? So when you hear a confession, that means something. It should be right? yeah. So we have one police officer, only one of the only one of the two, who claimed that they heard Mumia confess. Hours, I mean, literally an hour after Mumia supposedly made this confession, that one police officer, Gary Wakeshaw, files an official report, said the Negro male made no comments. Talking about Mumia, Mumia said nothing. Two months later. He remembers that he heard a confession. Well, well. So they asked him, Officer Wakeshaw, on December 9th, he said the Negro male made no comment. Now, February, whatever, you're saying that he did make a comment. Could you explain that? And Wakeshaw says, well, you know, what he said, it disgusted me. And I didn't realize that it had any importance until today. I know, keep, 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 <laughs> Don't say what you really mean, but it is nonsense. And the courts have allowed that to happen. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to now this video. A photographer who was there on the scene of the crime on December 9, 1981. This photographer got there before the police got there with their crime scene investigators. And you'll see police tampering with evidence. You'll see evidence that was supposedly there according to the court testimonies that weren't, that wasn't there. So you'll see this. And um, believe your eyes. They ain't that, that lying eyes business. <laughs> you gonna believe me or your lying eyes? No. Look and you will see. when I was working on the German version of my book, Race Against Death. So, I saw a photo of the crime scene, which I had not previously seen. Fortunately, the photographer had an unusual name, Pedro P. Pollock of the Third, which was at the bottom of the photo. Soon, I was on the phone with him. He had been the only press photographer at the scene, arriving there 10 to 12 minutes after the shooting, 
And he had taken 31 photographs, 26 of which he still had, and which he sent my way. We then communicated via email until I was finally able to meet him in a Philadelphia suburb in August of 2006. In the meantime, he showed me a lot of details in his photographs that I hadn't even noticed as one who was not there. Two aspects stick out in particular. They concern the star witnesses of the prosecution, Robert Schubert and Cynthia White. In other words, the two witnesses which stand at the center of the suppression of exculpatory evidence we are discussing tonight, the famous Brady issue. The evidence shows that Schubert asked prosecutor Joseph McGill for money and that the prosecution charges pending against White were all miraculously dropped after judicial officers in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts had exchanged memoranda which stressed that she had been a witness in a very important case and that Joseph McGill had a keen interest in the proceeding. The core meaning of the Pollock of Photos is that Joseph McGill had very good reason to take good care of these witnesses. Because these photos blow the whole prosecution theory of the events and of how Officer Faulkner was killed completely out of the water, and with it the testimony by Chauvet and White on which this theory is based. Before I walk you through the Pollock of photos, uh, let's listen to how prosecutor Joseph McGill in the film Case for Reasonable Doubt describes the events that led to the death of police officer Faulkner and the murder charge against Mamiya Abujemal. He runs an alert, takes out this charter over to the doctor and fires and shoots the officer in the back. The officer then manages to turn around a little bit because of the momentum of the bullet. Was not did not affect the vital organs at that time and was able to get off the shot at that time, which hit uh, Mr. Jamal in the chest area. He then, that is, also Faulkner, continued to fall down. And as he fell down straight on the pavement area, he was, for all intents and purposes, debilitated. The defendant, Mr. Jamal, at this point, having been stopped, uh, none went over and straddled the officer, took both hands and held the weapon that he pulled out previously and fired four times. One of the shots, that is the second shot or third shot, we don't know which, actually went through the, uh, in between the eyes of the officer's head. That was the killing bullet. You have heard prosecutor Joseph McGill's version of the events. According to him, uh, Billy Cook, Mumia's brother, was stopped by Officer Faulkner. They stood uh, within what you see on the picture as uh, the green square. Abu Jamal saw the stop, uh, ran across the parking lot, uh, shoots Faulkner in the back. The officer falls down, and while falling, gets off the shot, wounds Abu Jamal who then stood, stands over him and kills the officer execution star by uh, firing several shots, only one of which hits but kills him. The question uh, really then is, uh, who are the witnesses for this? Uh, you see them uh, in the three circles. One of the witnesses, that's the blue circle, uh, stood with his car on the other side of 13th Street, a local, localist uh, before a traffic light. Uh, and he basically confirmed what you just heard from McGill. But uh, the problem with him was uh, that he was unable to identify Abu Jamal as the shooter. And so he was much less valuable to the prosecution than the other two witnesses. And the other two witnesses uh, were Robert Jobber, that's the yellow circle, who claimed uh, to have stood right behind the police cruiser of Officer Faulkner. 
And Cynthia White, who claimed to have stood at the southeastern corner of 13th and Locust. Chilbert said uh, he saw only uh, the end of the, the events. Uh, he was a brother and uh, claimed to have been out of fair when he heard her charts. And then he looked up and uh, saw what uh, McGill just described. Cynthia White, in her turn, uh, claimed to have seen the whole sequence of Jamal when it was a parking lot, uh, shoots Faulkner, uh, gets shot, she did not see that, but she claimed she, she saw the execution style, uh, killing of Officer Faulkner. And uh, this is where the photographs come in to which we now directly jump. When Peter arrived, 10 to 12 minutes after the shooting, he found something that was both unforgettable and, as he later said, the most unprofessional handling of a crime scene that he had ever seen. There are some things that we never forget. I can tell you, I can even tell you the developer that I use, how long those negatives were developed, detectives weren't even on the scene at that point, uh, at crime, no crime units were on the scene. Mr. Mojo, the only thing that uh, prevented me from actually uh, inadvertently walking up behind uh, and going over the blood trail itself was the fact that they had a single uh, police barrier to the one side, and the only other thing they had to the other side was a police officer standing there saying, Myself. One of them was the mishandling of Jamal's and Officer Faulkner's guns by an officer by the name of James Fawkes, who held the guns in his bare hands and who happened to be uh, one of two, only two officers who claimed to have seen Abu Jamal's gun next to him when they arrived at the scene. This mishandling of uh, the guns, which he swore he did not do in court, severely undermines his credibility. And it seemed like they were doing much better than well. Can you tell me any further? Really? Come on, the one officer's walking around holding the police officer's gun and the alleged murder weapon in his hands. With no gloves. No gloves. No gloves. Didn't bag it. Nothing. One pillar of the prosecution's uh, theory of the case is that apart from Officer Faulkner, Billy Cook, who was not charged with the murder, and Abu Jamal, there was no one else uh, at the scene, so that only Abu Jamal could have done it. With regard to that, Pedro alerted me to another interesting fact. Namely, that Officer from Faulkner's police hat, which was later on found on the ground, was originally on the roof of the passenger side of Billy Cook's VW, strongly indicating the presence of a fourth person at the scene, who might then have run away, and who might actually have been the one who killed Officer Faulkner. Avocat's photos also illustrate other discrepancies at the crime scene. You notice right here on the top of the Volkswagen we have Officer Faulkner's hat. This is a shot that the newspaper picked up and now notice that Officer Faulkner's hat is down on the ground. The mishandling of the gun and the wandering hat are certainly interesting pieces of evidence, but what does all of this have to do with our witnesses, Jovert and White? Well, the best comes last. Let's take another quick walk through the crime scene with Peter Pollock. Peter Pollock. Let's take another quick walk through the crime scene with Peter Pollock of as he arrives at four o'clock in the morning on December 9th, nineteen eighty-one. Uh, first thing he sees. Mm -hmm. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow the 
the instructions to register this number and the permitted number to accept this recall for us and to refuse this free thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hey, Mobile. Hey. Thank you. 
being shown and the Pam Africa, the woman who has kept this movement alive for Pam Africa, the woman who's kept this wo- this movement alive for 41 years is, is right here. Front seat. We love you, Mumia. We won't stop until you walk in the streets of Philadelphia.
for Rumi. And then when other people are convicted or when other people are exonerated and they have precedent, I ain't going to law school, but I know that word, God. Precedent. And they say that once there's a precedent, you have to follow the precedent. And they said that a white man who was part of an Aryan prison gang could not have his association used against him. And yet, Mumia had his former association with the Black Panther Party for self-defense used against him. It's an exception that cannot hold. They said we got to use our brain. The laws do form by something called the reasonable man standard. I don't know when the homes didn't want to think about white folk, black folk, though. What would a reasonable person believe under these circumstances? Would a reasonable person believe that a black man in 1981 who just shot somebody, who just shot a police officer, is sitting in a room of police officers and says, I shot the police officer and didn't nobody hear it? And then, they right now, the Negro didn't say a thing. Yeah. It's unreasonable. But when it comes to me, reason don't matter. They say, well, the police wouldn't lie to us. Now, this is the Rizzo error. Some of y'all from Philly, most of y'all from Philly, y'all know the Rizzo era of Philadelphia. Wanting violence and cruelty, beating people to death. Rizzo said in public, Rizzo, one thing about Rizzo, he ain't lying to you, he told exactly who he was. He said, even if you're wrong, I'm going back to a room for the police officers. They walked through North Philly, they walked through South Philly, beat my father almost within an inch of his life. They didn't charge him. But he wasn't alone. They did it to everybody. The FBI investigated the Rizzo administration and said their behavior in the Philadelphia Police Department shocks the conscience. The FBI said that. And they ain't got no conscience. So, this ain't old stuff, 1995. Six more officers planted, caught the build up and planted evidence. Right. So while they're fighting for an appeal, defending the integrity of police, the police is getting caught planting evidence. That's why Brady is so important, not just to Maria's case, but to the black community. Right. Right. The state doesn't have the right to withhold evidence. The whole point of Brady is to say, if you got something that can get somebody free, you got to give it up. Right. You got to share it. That includes witnesses who might be on the payroll. Right. That includes people who might be snitches. Right. That includes police officers who have a record, a documented record of lying under oath. The police can't keep putting the lying police officer on the stand and not tell you that he's been convicted or caught lying. They have to tell it to you because it's exculpatory. It gets you out of prison, it gets you off. Because a reasonable person would say that absent this evidence, I wouldn't have made the same decision. Right. But what they did in the Romeo case is they made sure y'all didn't see none of that. Right. They didn't want you to hear about ballistic evidence. They didn't want to hear about guns that didn't match. They didn't want to hear about witnesses that didn't show up. They went on vacation the time of the trial. Right. Handwritten reports that ended up being typewritten even though they said it was handwritten. They didn't want you to hear none of that. But that's why we're here. Some of y'all from North Philly. Some of y'all from South Philly, some of y'all from West Philly. I can tell you all y'all, y'all all from the hood. And one thing we got in the hood is roaches. You know what roaches do? Whatever they want. When the lights is out. They eat your food, they go in your bag, they watch Netflix. They do whatever they got to do when the light is off. But when you put the light on, they run. They scatter. They become afraid. What this Philadelphia Police Department has done, what this prosecutor's office has done, has been in the dark. And what we do every single day, what Pam Africa has been doing, what Johanna is doing, what Mumia has been doing, what everybody in this room has been doing, is putting a light on this system so that they can continue.
to operate with impunity in the dark. See, the state ain't got no feelings. The state doesn't have feelings, it only has interests. The state didn't just get religion and decide to give up some evidence. Just like the state didn't decide to take me off death row. They thought that if we took death off the table, we would stop fighting for his life. But we didn't. And now they said, we're tired of these appeals. We're tired of coming back. How do you think Mamiya feel? How do you think his children feel? How do you think his grandson feel? How do you think these activists feel? We'd love to not go back. If you don't want us to go back, then do the right thing, judge. Do the right thing, judge. Six boxes that just happens to corroborate the very things that we've been saying since day one. That a witness with 36 prior convictions, 38 arrests, excuse me, forgive me, who had three pending at the time, and suddenly they all went away. And then she went away. A questionable witness who may not even be there. Asking for his money after he gave testimony that was questionable. And handwritten notes talking about how we're going to exclude jurors from the trial. Black jurors. A city of 40% black, and the jury pool ain't 40% black. One 20%. We got a box of evidence that shows every single thing we've been talking about. And they said we don't know what to do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn the lights out. We're going to turn the lights up. We're going to make it so bright that they can't do the wrong thing. Lucretia Clement, you ain't going to do the wrong thing this time. You are going to see this evidence. Y'all are going to tell the truth. And we're going to get the thing that we have been fighting for for 42 years. And that is justice. And justice is not slow death row. Justice is not a life sentence. Justice is bring Mumia home.
There was a report from an officer named Smolansky. I know I'm murdering his name, but bear with me. I went to a ghetto school. <laughs> this officer writes a report saying that the, the commander on the scene asked him to ride over to homicide with the cab driver. So here the police assigned a police officer to go to homicide with the cab driver. So if the cab was behind the officer's car, why was it moved in the first place before the people came? Why was it marked in terms of the police directive, crime scene directive? Again, lies. The guy wasn't behind the car. When you look at some of these crime scene photos, and we sent these crime scene photos to a guy whose job is to magnify images from deep space. When NASA sends his stuff out to Jupiter and Saturn, this guy's job is to magnify it and see what's there. You know, space moon and stuff like that. Well, he magnified the photos and found that Chobert's cab was on 13th Street. Not on Locust Street. Hello. And the prosecutors know all of this. Hello. So now we're going to have Larry Krasner say that um, there's no problem here. Well, the jury would have uh, convicted anyway. And this is what the priest of Clemens is saying. We'll, we'll forget about the evidence of jury tampering and keeping blacks off the jury. We'll, we'll forget about the thing with Cynthia White and how all of her cases were handled. And we'll forget about Robert Chobert and his handwritten note to the prosecutor weeks after the trial saying, where's my money? Because there was enough other evidence. Well, the other evidence doesn't make any sense. This business about shooting into the sidewalk. Let's get into the video. I'm just trying to waste some time. Run some time here. But I did a shooting uh, a test. I got a piece of sidewalk. I got a gun. I can it. So, um, we will um, get the video on, so you can see Mr. Krasner in his own language, and then we'll come back with uh, Dr. John Nidas. Okay, we're going to get this
the office responsible for disappearing 36,000 black men from Philadelphia streets. That's why it's called the Deep State. The office responsible for making Philadelphia the draconian law and order capital of the country, the district with the highest rate of incarceration of black and brown people in the country. That's Philadelphia. Krasner promised to change this. And he put emphasis on the city's Conviction Integrity Unit, which has exonerated 29 people falsely imprisoned through misconduct, lying, and tampering with evidence on the part of the police to obtain convictions. Uh, convicted falsely through the concealment of evidence of innocence on the part of the prosecutors and convicted falsely through eyewitness misidentification. What Larry Krasner said, he was trying to say a lot of nothing, but he did say that Mumia's case is a microcosm of what was wrong with the city. Mumia's case is truly a microcosm of these violations that I just outlined, for which he released Larry Krasner, 29 people, um, these violations were uh, rampant in the Philadelphia of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and why were they rampant? Because this was the high point of rogue white supremacy within the DA's office and the police department in Philadelphia. This was the era of Frank Rizzo, of Frank Rizzo's reign. This was the era of the McMahon tapes. A reference to the ADA Jack McMahon, who trained prosecutors right here in Philadelphia on how to exclude black people from the jury. Mumia was falsely convicted during this dark period in the history of Philadelphia. We now have a letter, as has been said, from key witness Robert Chobert, in which he is demanding to receive money owed to him by the prosecutor. The prosecutor promised him money in exchange for his te testimony. That's called the bribe. We know it signals a Brady violation because Robert Chobert was a kept witness. He was kept at a hotel, he was fed daily, and he was driven to work every night by the police and brought back to work and it happened all, all over again until the end of the trial. We also have a cache of letters from the prosecutor, Joe McGill, to other court officers about another key witness, Cynthia White. These letters request that no decision be made about her outstanding charges before consulting with Joe McGill. We know from another series of documents found recently and filed just this February 22nd, that not only was she cleared of charges that would have put her behind bars for more than 20 years for fingering a man, she was also allowed the freedom of practicing her trade as a sex worker unperturbed by police. If that's not a Brady violation, I don't know what is. The Brady violation that hasn't made it to any court hearing is the suppression of even clear evidence of innocence of even clearer evidence of innocence. And that's the presence of a fourth person at the crime scene, a man by the name of Kenneth Freeman. We know that there was a fourth person at the crime scene for many reasons. Kenneth Freeman was the business partner of Billy Cook. Both he and Billy Cook were stopped by Officer Faulkner on December 9, 1981. Um, why? They had, we don't know. They had just shut down the, the newsstand they co-owned um, in uh, Center City. That's why this whole thing started, this thing started. Billy Cook was driving his Volkswagen and Kenneth Freeman was in the passenger seat that night. Officer Faulkner asked Billy Cook to get out of his car and Officer Faulkner started beating up Billy Cook, Mumia's brother, 
um, with his walkie-talkie. Mumia happened to be dropping a passenger off nearby, and he looked and saw that his own brother was being beaten by a cop. He approached the scene of the crime and was immediately shot by Officer Faulkner. It was at that point that Kenneth Freeman got out of the passenger seat and shot Officer Faulkner. That's what happened on the night of December 9th, 1981. Officer Faulkner was shot execution style, likely from a distance because it was a clean shot right underneath the eye. The only person at the crime scene with the training to kill anyone in this manner was Kenneth Freeman, a decorated Vietnam veteran. A driver's license application found in Officer Faulkner's shirt pocket led the police straight to Kenneth Freeman, who they picked up the next morning, but the police let him go. We also know that Kenneth Freeman was at the crime scene because his presence was acknowledged by Prosecutor Joe McGill in the trial of Billy Cook, who was also being tried concurrently with Mumia in a separate trial about the same crime scene. But he was tried for assault of a police officer. Billy Cook was tried for assault of a police officer. Mumia was uh, tried for killing the police officer. The presence of Kenneth Freeman at the crime scene was acknowledged at Billy Cook's trial by Prosecutor Joe McGill, but it was concealed in Mumia's trial. And the question is, why? We also know that the fourth person at the crime scene was there because Officer Faulkner's hat was originally seen on top of Billy Cook's car, right above the passenger seat. The Pedro Polakoff photos show that, but Officer Faulkner's hat ended up on the ground, dramatically placed next to a trail of Officer Faulkner's blood because the cops cooked up the crime scene. They moved things around to paint a different picture of what happened that night. Why was the district attorney's office not interested in the Polakoff photographs? Polakoff sent the photographs to the DA's office. Why did the prosecutor, Joe McGill, conceal the presence of Kenneth Freeman at the crime scene? All of these are Brady violations, violations that are taken very seriously by prosecutors committed to reestablishing trust between the DA's office and the black communities it disproportionately locks up. Brady is sacrosanct. Brady is holy because the kind of rank corruption we see practiced by prosecutors like Joe McGill in the case of Mumia, the concealment of evidence of innocence from the defense makes a mockery of the office of the DA. It also leads to sham trials as the judge explained earlier. When he was elected, Larry Krasner understood that he had to clean up his office if he was going to be taken seriously by the black people who elected him. He had to excommunicate, throw out all dark prosecutors who were reared in his culture by the devil of racism and white supremacy in the DA's office. But he kept a few old guard prosecutors. Tragically, he assigned the same old guard prosecutors who framed Mumia back in 1982 to litigate the claims before Judge Lucretia Clemens today. It's a case literally of asking the goat to watch the lettuce. In the last six months, many of us sat through the hearings in Judge Lucretia Clemens' court, and we watched these prosecutors lie arrogantly about the facts of the case. Who are these prosecutors in the DJK's office who are lying about what actually happened in Mumia's case? Cole Stevens and Tracy Kavanaugh. We need to expose them. They kept repeating the same thing over and over and over again, that this is Abu Jamal's upteenth appeal and that we've litigated all of this. But that's a lie. This is the first time in the history of this case 
that we have hard new evidence of innocence never before seen by any courtroom because it had been concealed by the prosecutor's office for almost four decades. Brady versus Maryland has been has not been litigated previously in this case, and that is why we are talking about Brady today. I'm going to end. On victory night in 2018, Krasner said this, quote, Our vision is of a criminal justice system that makes things better, that is just, that is based on preventing crime, and is based on building up society rather than tearing it apart. This is what we want in Mumia's case. And in those of so many innocent others wrongfully convicted or overcharged uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Justice for Daniel Faulkner means releasing Mumia now and formally identifying the person who killed him. Reckoning with the long history of racism in Philadelphia means granting Mumia the Brady claim, releasing him from prison for the concealment of exculpatory evidence by prosecutors, but also for having held him on death row unconstitutionally for 28 and a half years. Free Mumia. Please do 
not stop talking about this. Please ask people, why aren't you talking about this? This is in our country. This is in your city. This is in your state. If anybody ought to be talking about any case, it ought to be case, right? Last thing. I'm a preacher. I'm a judge. Jesus was convicted wrong. All right? And Pontius Pilate washed his hands, knowing that Jesus was innocent, and sent Jesus to Calvary. We're coming towards Easter time. Judge Clemens is a person of faith. If she won't let Mania go, then she's doing to Mania what Pontius Pilate did to Jesus. And let me say this right now. I was just 24 years, okay? On appeals and on trials. I did go to trials. I know I've had relatives murdered. I know how it feels to have been loved on But we never let the friends of the murdered people decide what justice is. We don't let the relatives of the murdered people decide what justice is. I got feelings for Maureen Faulkner, okay, because I have relatives who were murdered. But you don't let me go and decide what justice is. For the folks who are accused of murdering my kinfolk. Please do not let folks from the police department or from Officer Butler's family <coughs> say what that says. Officer Butler's family deserves to have the real killer family. They deserve to have the real killer family, not to have the wrong person die by incarceration. Would you please say that? May I sit down? Yeah. Please, ma'am, please, sir. I got love for you, but let's bring the leader home. Okay, moving very long, we're moving to a uh, video statement by a person that many of you will recognize, uh, Colin Kaepernick. And while this is going on, uh, so some people will be moving around for. Uh, if you can, uh, provide uh, little assistance uh, to this movement. The name of Judge Clemens has been mentioned, and she's the judge that's currently handling the news appeal. Uh, Pennsylvania has a thing called the Code of Judicial Conduct. You know, Martin Luther King once said, you know, America, just be what you say you are on paper. And if America was what it was said to be on paper, we wouldn't be here. Right. Talking about this, because when we were to got some justice a long time ago. But this code of judicial conduct said judges should uphold the dignity of judicial office at all times, avoiding both impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in their professional and personal lives. You've heard from Judge Griffin, you've heard from Dr. Fernandez. The matter that's pending before the judge right now is real simple. 36 years of evidence that was held wrong under any circumstance at all. Not only should it at least be a new evidentiary hearing or a new trial, the reality is that this injustice is so large that it demands yes. the immediate and unconditional release of Maria Aboriginal.
His story has not changed. Mobile was shot, brutalized, arrested, and chained to a hospital bed. The first police officer assigned to him wrote in a report that the Negro male made no comment, as cited in Philly Mac. Yet 64 days into the investigation, another officer testified that Mumia had confessed to the killing. Mumia's story has not changed. But we're talking about the same Philadelphia Police Department whose behavior shocks the conscience, according to a 1979 DOJ report. Behaviors like shooting nonviolent suspects, abusing handcuffed prisoners, and tampering with evidence. It should therefore come as no surprise that according to Dr. Johanna Fernandez, over one-third of the 35 officers involved in Mubia's case were subsequently convicted of rank corruption, extortion, and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions in unrelated cases. This is the same Philadelphia Police Department where officers ran racial profiling sweeps like Operation Cold Turkey in March 1985, targeting black and brown folks. And bombed the move house in May of that year, killing 11 people, including five children, and destroying 61 homes. The same Philadelphia Police Department, whose officers eight days before the 2020 presidential election shot Walter Wallace Jr. dead in the streets in front of his crying mother. The Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police has unrelentingly campaigned for Mumia's execution. During their August 1999 national meeting, a spokesperson for the organization stated that they will not rest until Abu Jamal burns in hell. The former Philadelphia president of the Fraternal Order of Police, Richard Costello, went as far as to say that if you disagree with their views of Mumia, you can join him in the electric chair and that they will make it an electric couch. Found in December 2018 in an inaccessible storage room of the DA's office, six boxes of documents from Mumia's case reveal previously undisclosed and highly significant evidence showing that Mumia's trial was tainted by a failure to disclose material evidence in violation of the United States and Pennsylvania constitutions. He is a grandfather. He is an elder with ailments. He is a human being that deserves to be free. Free Mumia. Our next speaker is one who has also been a part of the effort to Shine. Can they hear me? Uh, you can. can. Yeah. I think we can. Can my brothers and sisters hear my voice? Yeah. Listen to my voice. Yeah. Well, my dear brother, Mumia. Yeah. Can you turn on your camera? I have a deep love and respect for Mumia Mumia. The profound respect for Mumia Mumia. The profound respect for Mumia Mumia.
of great people because in the face of all of this chronic hatred, here comes another love for you from me. I moved your heart. Oh, when I was with him, there was great James Cone and my dear brother Chris Hedges. Those hours have been in the prison. What did we do? We talked about Curtis Mayfield. We talked about Daddy Hathaway. We talked about Nina Simone. We talked about Aretha Franklin. We talked about the freedom fighters, Martin K. Powell, not just because they're online. 
live stream. The fight for justice is not a sprint race. It's actually a marathon, and it's a marathon relay. And after we all run our long 26.5 mile leg, we got to hand that baton off. Yeah. And this fight will continue. So once again, thanks. Uh, the some of the evidence that uh, Michael Shipman has put on. There's copies of it in the back. Uh, there's a real good primer on what this case is all about. And again, you've heard from some experts here. And believe what you see. And what you've seen for the last four decades is an absolute outrage. And it needs to end. And there's a woman who sits in the criminal justice center. Leave that phrase alone for me. But there's a judge who is sitting in Philadelphia's criminal justice center that has the power and the duty to right a wrong. And in doing so, she will only be following the law. Right. So the question is, Judge Simmons, Clemens, are you going to follow the law? The question is, Barry Crest, are you going to follow the law? The question is, FOP, are you going to follow the law? We know the answer to that. Because we've seen it for decades. Actually, we've seen it for centuries. So listen, thank you very much. Thanks to all the people who work very, very hard.
Okay, as they say, our cooking is come to an end at some point, so we have to conclude today. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you again.